name is Dale McNeil. I'm the uh, chief psychologist at Langley Porter Hospital and Clinics and director of clinical psychology training program. And it is an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Ekman and uh, Dr. Eve Ekman. Um, they will be doing a joint presentation, and I'll just make a, a few comments uh, of introduction about each of them. Dr. Eve Ekman is an Osher Fellow in the Postdoctoral Training Program in Research in Integrative Medicine at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, she worked as a medical social worker at San Francisco General, then returned to UC Berkeley where she obtained her PhD in the Department of Social Welfare. <coughs> At the Osher Center, she is um, studying meaning, empathy, and burnout in health providers uh, with residents in training. Um, <coughs> Dr. Paul Ekman is prof <coughs> Professor Emeritus in Psychology at UCSF. He's perhaps best known for furthering our understanding of nonverbal behavior. He's authored more than 100 published articles and holds several honorary degrees. He was named by the American Psychological Association as one of the most influential psychologists of the 20th century. Time magazine in 2009 described him as one of the most, one of the hundred most influential people in the world. In 2014, Dr. Ekman was ranked 15th among the most influential psychologists in the 21st century uh, by archives of scientific psychology. Dr. Ekman obtained his PhD in clinical psychology at Adelphi <coughs> University in 1958. Then he completed a one-year internship um, in clinical psychology here at UCSF at Langley Porter in the UCSF clinical psychology training program. <coughs> he served two years as first lieutenant and chief psychologist at Fort Dix in New Jersey and returned to Langley Porter, where he became a professor of psychology in the UCSF Medical School uh, from 1972 uh, to retiring in 2004. His, his research uh, started in the 1950s, focused on hand movements and gesture. In the mid-1960s, he began to study facial expression and emotion uh, after receiving a grant to study cross-cultural aspects of nonverbal behavior. He traveled to Papua New Guinea to study nonverbal behavior among a uh, Stone Age tribe. His research provided the strongest evidence to date that Darwin, not Margaret Mead, was correct in um, claim, <coughs> identifying that facial emotions, facial expressions are uh, universal. Dr. Ekman and his colleagues uh, developed the first and only comprehensive tool for objectively measuring facial movement, the facial, affect, the facial action coding system, which <coughs> remains the gold standard for identifying any movements in the face um, free of interpretive inferences. Uh, subsequently, Dr. Ekman and his colleagues uh, have shown that neural networks can be used to um, uh, develop computer-based uh, uh, assessment of facial uh, movements. <coughs> um, another theme in his research is the study of deception. Starting with clinical cases in which patients falsely claimed they weren't depressed in order to commit suicide when no longer under supervision. When films were uh, examined in slow motion, Dr. Ekman and his colleagues uh, saw micro facial expressions which reveal strong negative feelings that the patient was trying to hide. His article, Nonverbal Leakage and Clues to Deception, remains one of the most widely cited articles in the field. After he retired from the uh, University of California in 2004, he's continued to be very active. Um, <coughs> He translated his work into uh, ways that are available, uh, accessible to the general public, then uh, active in media presentations, but also has been sought out by many uh, groups, including law enforcement. His uh, classic book, Telling Lies, uh, drew the attention of multiple law enforcement agencies uh, who have consulted him in many contexts, and he's provided many trainees to different agencies. Uh, also, uh, including the Transportation Safety Administration Screening Program, <coughs> the Department of Defense, and others. And some of his current work emerges from his close relationship with the Dalai Lama, uh, 
reflecting more than 50 hours spent in one-to-one -one conversation with the Dalai Lama, an e-book moving toward global compassion is now available. His next online interacting training tool enables user to, users to examine their emotional profile and the unique way in which they experience emotion as well as how their view of themselves corresponds to how intimate partners view them. <coughs> this undertaking marks his trajectory from establishing universals and expression of emotion to elucidating individual differences in how emotions are experienced. With great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Edmund. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive introduction. It reminded me of things I had forgotten. Uh, the, uh, I am delighted to be giving this grand round. I spent my entire career in the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF. So this is coming home again. And uh, <laughs> it's a special delight to be able to share this presentation with my daughter, Dr. Eve Ekman, uh, on my right, uh, who you'll soon find out is a better teacher than I am. Uh, the, we're going to show you something that we jointly created and have just made available to the public in the last uh, four or six weeks. It's called <coughs> An Atlas of Emotions. And uh, the idea of it is that you can, on your own, use this to learn about your own emotional experience. Now already, even though it's just been released, it's being used as a teaching vehicle in classes. Uh, it's ideal for teaching. Uh, it's pretty. It's illuminating. It's easy. And you see things that you didn't realize that you knew. That's the nature of emotion. We all, of course, experience emotions. But at the moment we're experiencing them, we usually don't have much awareness of what's going on. I believe that's in the nature of emotion itself, is to run without interference. And of course, if you want to lead the most constructive emotional life, you want to be at least able to monitor and know what emotion you're feeling. And in research I did some years ago, I found there were two things that everybody wanted about emotion. One is to choose when to have it, lots of luck. And the second is to choose how to behave when you are emotional, and again, you have to introduce something that's foreign to emotion, which is awareness. Okay, now, where do we go, Eve? Okay. Is this on? Wonderful. Good morning. Really happy to be here with you all. And we know we have some online audience, so hello to everyone out there. Comfy in their beds. We <laughs> definitely appreciate you all showing up after the long weekend. And we're going to do an overview um, here just briefly to give you a sense of what we'll be covering today. We're going to start, though we had wonderful introductions already, with just a little bit of a review of the work that we've done that prepared us in different ways to do this project together of visualizing emotion, creating a tool that people could access without prior knowledge and without even a whole lot of necessary interest in psychology. So we'll talk a bit about that, and we'll talk about the scientific basis of this project. So in undertaking anything funded by a spiritual leader, uh, you have a hefty job to make sure that it appears as something that everyone can relate to, irrespective of beliefs or ideology or interests. So my dad will cover the survey that he did uh, prior to us really embarking on the project. We'll then talk about what it was like to work with a design company to try and visualize emotion and the challenges both in intellectually and the challenges in concretely making this possible, uh, if you can call the internet a concrete place to make something possible. We're then going to give you a live tour of the Atlas since it's online now, and we'd like to just walk you through and guide you through some of our own thinking. It needs no guide. But we are here, so we're excited to walk you through some of the thinking and behind-the-scenes ideas of this atlas. And then we will 
uh, talk a bit about the future directions. So that is really going to be largely in our question and answer. We want to know how you think this might be useful in your work, where it could go. Just a small note to recognize, we don't necessarily have any funding to do anything else, but we still would like your ideas. So I'm going to um, give it back to my dad to talk a little bit more about his history here and how it prepared him for the work we did on the Atlas. Well, with such an introduction, uh, I don't think I really need to add more. I mean, I learned things about myself I had forgotten from that introduction. And uh, the, uh, I think the one thing I want to elaborate on is that this atlas really grew out of the meetings with the Dalai Lama, which grew out of my relationship with my daughter. It was only because of E that I got to know and meet the Dalai Lama and regard him now as a close friend. Uh, sounds a little presumptuous, but uh, there's no one else that I've ever spent 50 hours talking one-on-one -on -one with about emotion. It's strange. I mean, you know, I see a lot of colleagues here with whom I've spent hours talking about academic gossip, but not about substance itself. That rarely, rarely happens. Uh, the, we do that with our students, but not as much with our colleagues. And uh, the, it was the Dalai Lama's idea to try to make an atlas. Uh, he called it a map. An atlas technically is just a series of maps. Uh, we learned that working with our cartography firm, Stamen, with whom we developed this. Uh, and when you try to translate knowledge, scientific knowledge, into any metaphor, let alone the metaphor of mapping, you learn things you didn't know you knew, and you learn what you don't know, that you need to find out in order to create a map that people can make sense of. And the goal of this is really to provide something that stands alone, that people can use and learn about this most intimate part of their own experience, and can be used in teaching. And already, even though it was just released in the last month, it's being used in everything from high school to uh, postgraduate classes, which is a delight to us. Maybe you can tell folks a bit more about the universals and how that led to some of the thinking underlying the emotions we chose. My prompter, you can see. Thank you very much. The, uh, uh, okay, that's my God. Yeah, that's me in 1967 hiking up to a Stone Age culture in New Guinea. I, in order to be certain that expressions were not the result of media exposure, but were, as Darwin had claimed, built into us, uh, I had to find people that had been exposed to the media. And even in 1967, there were very few left in the world. Uh, but I did find one in the highlands of New Guinea. Uh, those of you who have any background in neurology, this was where Carlton Vitacek did his work. He provided me with the facilities. He was then studying Kuru, disease that was killing half of these people. Nobody knew the cause of it, other than that it probably was not what they thought, which was voodoo. It was had a biological base. Indeed, that turned out, although it is a member of our UCSF faculty who found that it was prions that were responsible and got a Nobel Prize for that. So uh, UCSF has an interesting connection to it, although at that time, I guess, uh, it did not. Now, let's see what else we have to say. Okay. Uh, I think you already heard how I came upon microexpressions completely by accident by studying the films at one point, I was filming on 16 millimeter film, 12 minute interviews, because that was the largest cartridge you could get, was to record 12 minutes of sound, uh, with every patient that entered Langley Porter at admission and at discharge, and looked at the difference. And uh, at discharge, some of the patients subsequently uh, uh, took their own life when they were free of supervision, even though when you looked at the film, they looked in good spirits, as we would say in non-technical language. Uh, looking at those same films in slow motion is where I found micro-expressions. 
there's where I first saw the evidence of concealment and that it was possible to, once you knew that they were there, it was possible to learn how to see them at real time without slow motion. And we have a tool on the internet now uh, that actually literally millions of people have used in order to learn how to spot micro expressions, you know, to see these concealed emotions. Talking to an audience like this, I should say that when you see a micro expression, you cannot tell from the expression itself whether it's the result of suppression or repression. And the reason I know that is because of Marty Horowitz, who's sitting here in the front row, who supplied me with some films of patients who were unwittingly, unconsciously concealing their emotions from themselves. And sure enough, they were micro expressions too. And they looked just the same as someone who was deliberately doing it. So all you can tell from a micro is that it's a concealed emotion. Whether it's suppression or repression, you have to figure out from the context and your follow-up questioning. Thank you, Marty. I wouldn't have been able to know that without your help. Now, where am I? Uh, the Dalai Lama. That really came about, and the only reason I had any interest in him was because I knew my daughter was interested from having lived in a Tibetan refugee camp for a week uh, when she was a high school student. Uh, and, uh, but he and I had what I call a deja vu experience, which he's very amused. That's just a name. It doesn't explain it. He explains it by the fact that in the previous incarnation we were related. That's an explanation, not one I accept as a scientist, but at least it's an explanation. Deja vu is just a label. I don't have an explanation for why with some people, when you meet them, you feel like you've known them all your life. He would say you have, just in a previous life. That's not part of Western thinking. But I've come, I think one of the more important things I've learned through the many hours I've spent talking to the Dalai Lama is just because from a Western science point of view, I can't explain it. Doesn't mean it, isn't, doesn't mean it isn't real. There are a lot of things I couldn't explain 20 years ago that we can explain now. And 20 years later, there will be explanations for things we don't understand now. Now, what have I missed that I need to talk about? Um, just that at the Mind and Life meeting is when you first started thinking about emotions together and how to help people from a Western psychological and Eastern contemplative approach. Thank you very much, Eve. <laughs> <laughs> now we can go on. So now we're going to show just a short video, and this is one taken out of the many hours of dialogue, and one I think that is um, quite pertinent to this discussion of the Atlas of Emotions. The Dalai Lama said that in the 21st century, we must find out how to achieve a calm mind, and our approach must be secular. My thinking is that our target, calm mind, because the calm mind uh, directly so related with peace of mind, and calm mind, uh, I think, the 24 hours, including dream. Calm mind, you see, uh, and can maintain one. Compassion, 24 hours, I don't think. Uh, uh, so occasionally, occasionally, it's a practical level, when some disturbing mosquito comes, mm -hmm. <laughs> then sometimes you need to live <laughs> but still, you see, that kind of action you see, can take while your mind very calm. Yes, I think there's a distinction you're making between a continuous state, hmm? a calm mind, yes. and a capacity that can be called forth when an event requires it by compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion isn't there continuously, but when you see suffering mm -hmm. or anticipate suffering, mm -hmm. then the compassion emerges. Mm -hmm. And if I understood you correctly yesterday, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I did, but if I did, mm -hmm. 
then if you have a calm mind, it is more likely that the compassion will emerge when called for. Yes? Well, that also, yes. Calm mind, uh, you can see things more realistically, more objectively. More vividly. Oh, vividly, several way. Oh. But now you say, my sort of uh, approach is, now question, how to develop calm mind? The real sort of, of obstacle or destroyer of calm mind is fear, suspicion, hatred, anger, greed, too much ambition. These things are the, uh, the destroyer of calm mind. So I know you just want to keep watching. And the good news is that all of these webisodes and all of the information about online training is on my dad's website. And these videos, there's I think almost 14 of them. They're all just awesome little tidbits and pick-me-ups in the middle of the day. As a stress researcher, I'm telling you, if things are going poorly, just watch a little interaction and meaningful discussion of emotion, and you will feel a little better. Um, so that was just a little description to give you context of why create an atlas of emotions? Don't we have en enough things on the internet already? Um, and it really is His Holiness's strong belief that we need this ability to understand our emotions, to have any capacity for peace of mind. And not just a peace of mind that would make our life a little better, which is absolutely important, but a peace of mind that would lead to harmony in the world. That is, that is his goal. And this is a topic he brought up I would say probably every six months for about the last 15 years. You, if you went back and you wanted to archive his videos, which again would just make you feel happy, because he laughs a lot, um, you would see that map of emotion, map of emotion, it's just a term that he continues to push around. He had no idea what he was suggesting. He didn't have a vision of what it would look like. He just knew that it was important. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my background. I'm sure I'm the, I'm the lesser known Dr. Ekman in this room. And just want to give you a little context of what made this project so exciting for me. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I went to UC Berkeley, but I will say that my best training was at San Francisco General Hospital in the ER. Any ER docs in the room? Residents? People who've passed through? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Nevada. Um, so it, it was just such an incredible place for me to work and experience such meaning in what I was doing and also face a lot of emotional exhaustion and a lot of feelings of fatigue. When I went back for my doctoral training program, what I was interested in is how do we sustain compassion and true empathy among our providers and how do we help them do that on a daily and weekly basis. Now, what was surprising to me about the ER was, despite this very high level of stress on a daily basis, people were not all burnt out. Uh, they, in fact, showed up with integrity and were able to interact, engage, and find meaning in their work. There's not a whole lot of research on it, but I was very heartened to hear um, the CEO of the AMA in a small podcast I listened to last night describe that the most important thing we need to sustain our faculty of medical providers is to help them connect with their patients and find meaning. So I, I couldn't agree more, and most of my research has been on that idea. I was really fortunate to have attended um, the Mind and Life meeting in 2000 and started to understand what it would mean to bring this Eastern contemplative approach alongside the Western psychological approach to emotion. This training, Cultivating Emotional Balance, that my dad and the Buddhist scholar Alan Wallace developed and was actually tested here at UCSF. Margaret Kemeny, who's at Laurel Heights, was the uh, first PI, but it's one of those papers where there's just such a long tail, the legacy of maybe 15 or 20 people who are involved, and they are many of them uh, throughout UCSF. And in that training, it was designed for school teachers. How do we help people with a high stress burden on a daily basis whose main role is to support others? And I adapted this training from its 42-hour version, first to a 16-hour version to work with juvenile jail officers in San Mateo for my dissertation. And now I've been working with residents, some I've even seen a couple in the room, and doing trainings on reducing stress through promoting emotional awareness and really connecting to the meaning of our work. 
Unfortunately, the systemic issues of what doesn't work about hospitals is not going away anytime soon. Not that it shouldn't and not that many great people aren't working on it, but in the meantime, how do we build skills so people can become aware of their emotions and manage them? So that was the lens in which I approached this atlas. I was very aware from the work I was doing that people really loved learning a language to describe their experience of emotions. And yet, when they tried to teach it to others, they fell short. People would always associate emotion just with what we signal on our face. Enormously important what we signal on our face, and yet, there's so much more about our felt experience. So this slide here at the top is a, the last meeting um, that we had with His Holiness. This was in February in Minnesota. Um, and one fun fact that you get to know about having any encounter with the Dalai Lama is he is not a fan of the computer or the touchpad. <laughs> and in a couple earlier meetings, we'd showed him this atlas on the screen, and he kind of was like, meh, not my thing. And so we brought these printed books, and uh, it actually inspired us. We will be working on a book project as well, but a printed book for him to look through the materials. So you see the book beneath. And he had something to say about almost every single page. I mean, the ideas are so interesting to him. The way he represented emotion in that last video for the emotion researchers in the room, I see a couple, um, you'll realize that he has a different approach, and Buddhist psychology has a different approach to emotion. That could be an entire other lecture. I won't go into it. But he has found it very compelling, this Western scientific approach to emotions as discrete events. And he believes that through our identification of these discrete events, we can create awareness. So I know this is, we'll keep saying awareness and emotions, or we're hoping that these ideas will come together. Um, what you see below is one of the groups I've trained in cultivating emotional balance. I've now trained over 250 teachers uh, and from 22 countries in cultivating emotional balance, which over seven years is actually quite a small amount. Um, but really enjoyed. I, I do the first two weeks of emotional skills training, and then the last three weeks of silent meditation training is taught by Alan Wallace. So if that doesn't scare you out of it, I don't know what would. But it's a wonderful training, and I'm often teaching it here at UCSF, so if you would like to know more, just please be in contact. The Dalai Lama comes up with many suggestions. If you, you can't possibly follow all of them. And so this map one, I ignored until I was told that he keeps, not only keeps talking about it, but he says I'm working on it when I ha am not. <laughs> In a sense, that was very coercive, which he is not loath to be at times. Uh, once he starts talking about it and says they were working on it, well, you got to start working on it. And indeed, he did. And using this metaphor of the map uh, not only makes it accessible to people in a way that text does not, but it raises questions you haven't thought through completely. Uh, it's very challenging and a lot of fun. And you'll get to see some of this. But he has a stronger belief in science than I do. I spent my whole life doing science, but I know there are things that, as a scientist, I don't understand, and I don't have a way of approaching in science. But he thinks that we know more than we do, or at least he thinks that if it's based on science, it will have an acceptance that it will not have if it's based on Buddhist thinking. And his last book, which I highly recommend, um, I can remember Beyond the religion. name. What? Beyond religion. Beyond religion. Is a completely secular ethics that he's proposed. I think it's really quite remarkable and uh, quite useful. And uh, we do need ethics to lead our lives. And religions, from his point of view, have been the major source of killing in past centuries. And so if we're going to have an ethical framework that brings us together, it has to be beyond religion. Uh, the, he urged that in creating the map, it be based on what scientists who study emotion agree about, which you can see is the title of an article, based on first finding out how many scientists are there in the world 
who consider a motion to be one of their primary fields. 248 is what I found if you look at publications as your index. And I did a survey of them. Uh, and uh, the results of them as to what they agree about is what's reported in this article. Here are some of the survey questions and some of the answers uh, to it. And there are only five emotions that more than 70% of emotion scientists have been, think has been firmly established. And those are the five that the atlas is built around. And you can see them named right up there in front of you. The uh, Since it was a mail survey, we, using the internet, we had to limit the number of questions we asked. But here are some other things you can see. Uh, these numbers are going to change, I hope, in the next 10 years with more research. The, this isn't a final answer. This is where we are right now. Uh, some of the people sitting in this room have the responsibility to change these numbers through more research in coming years. Okay, where are we, my dear? Uh, what you see here, next to the word stamen, is Eric Rodenbach, the uh, head of a company called Stamen, that by good fortune happens to be located in San Francisco. They're, and that's who we worked with to create the map. They're cartographers, and this is the first time they really were making a map based on something that's conceptual. And the process of trying to visualize emotions. So everyone in this room has experienced emotions. How would you draw fear? I mean, would it be a shape? Would it be a symbol? It, I mean, it was like, unfathomably hard to figure out a way that didn't feel too um, cliche or too abstract. I mean, the very basic facts. So what we knew when we started the process was, okay, well, there's agreement on these five universals. We're going to display those. That's about all we knew. Some sense that it would be important to also look at, well, within this family of anger, there are so many varietals, right? Everything from annoyance to fury. How much of that do we want to include? And then not only are these different states of anger, there's different actions or ways that people respond. Do we include that as well? There's different ways that some people experience it in their body. Do we include that? Now, maybe needless to say, there is much more than we could include, far much more. And we had to maybe twice completely start over. <laughs> Uh, and this is having pretty extensive designs. And at one point, there was a, a bit of a design crisis, uh, realizing that we had essentially created a textbook online. There was just so many words, and there wasn't a visual path. Now, there are many people in this room who probably know a lot more about what is the process of visual learning and why it is so different than what we listen to or what we read. But what we wanted people to do was explore and to be really inspired by this uh, discovery. I think we need a power cord. It says it's going to run out. Is there? No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Any, anybody in the room have a mouth power cord in your pocket? Yeah. One of these long ones. Great. The spirit of compassion is alive. Thank you. Well, I guess it's, you know, kind of mutual benefit. Thank you. Is this it? Outstanding. Um, we are back in action. So the process of design with Stamen uh, was really exciting and really often frustrating. But I'd say one of the most um, compelling parts for my dad and uh, myself as well was there was questions and ideas we'd never thought of. Now, that might not be that surprising for me where I am in my career, but that there were ideas about emotion that he had never thought of was really astounding and exciting. I'm not sure I completely agree with you that I never thought of it. <laughs> I just hadn't had a way to uh, visualize them or even write about them. You're trying to write scientific articles. I mean, it's an agony. All of you in this room have done it now, and you know, the viciousness of our colleagues 
who anonymously review us. <laughs> Incidentally, for the last 20 years, I've never done an anonymous review. I always insist my name be revealed. Uh, you can say the same things, but just more kindly, with more compassion, in a more constructive fashion, and not enjoy the pleasures of cutting someone to shreds. Uh, which too much of academia uh, emphasizes. Uh, it's really, you know, and we do no favor to our graduate students that they observe that kind of behavior in us, and we do no favors to the field itself. All right, enough moralizing. Are we going to show them the atlas? So, yes, fasten your seatbelts, or rather, how many people in this room have already looked online at the atlas? Just curious. Okay. Oh, Great. Yeah, hey. Great. <laughs> this is uh, this is the web address, but if you Google it, it will come up. And we're just going to change screens here. Hello. <laughs> Let's get started. So there are the five of oceans, and representing them, the choice of colors, some of it seemed obvious, blue for sadness, red for anger, uh, hard to say what disgust is, uh, and Jordan seemed like a nice color. Uh, but notice that these things are changing, and changing in their size, as in each of our lives, at any point in time, how large a particular emotion plays in our lives isn't static. It changes day to day, within the day. So we're trying to represent this by this visualization. And these are, if you like, the continents, the five emotion continents of the atlas. Each continent has states. Now, that's really nice because states is a technical psychological term for a momentary uh, set of feelings and expressions and sensations, but it's also a cartographic term. Uh, so let's go next. Shall we choose fear? Shall we? <laughs> so very simple definition. We really try to keep the words minimal, as I mentioned before. So there are the different states of fear that are named in the English language as far as we could best determine by consulting two of the major dictionaries. And we've put them on a scale of intensity, obviously, trepidation. You can't be extremely trepidated. Uh, that's funny, trepidated. Uh, <laughs> just like you can't be just slightly, having a slight experience of terror. So some of these words spread over a considerable range of intensity, and some do not. And so we're trying to define them if you want see them, but to visually represent them. So you can expand any one of these to see the different actions. And of course, the actions can be uh, constructive or destructive. And the criteria for constructive versus destructive is one that uh, I developed with the Dalai Lama, it's whether or not that experience furthers future collaboration between you and the other person. Even though it may temporarily obstruct it, in the long run, is it going to prevent it or facilitate it? We are social animals. We cannot exist in isolation. We have to collaborate with others. And if our emotional experiences occur in such a way that they further that, then it's constructive. You can interfere with it then we consider it destructive. My deal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I also wanted to just add in a little um, kind of depth here. This was an area we had an ongoing debate for maybe six months um, around what are the actions we want to represent. I was in favor of including what uh, my dad was calling intentional actions or reparative actions. So when I'm feeling anxiety or, uh, let's say, little dread, you know, like on my way here this morning, uh, a little bit late, there was traffic. Um, there was a couple other things. I, I luckily didn't um, 
ruminate too hard or scream and yell, I, I did take a couple deep breaths. And so that was a more reparative action. And yet, when we started adding those in, there was two things to be contended with. Are we being prescriptive? And can we actually fit this on the screen? <laughs> so these kind of issues that we had, both on a design scale, as well as what do we want to show to people? Are we trying to tell them what they should be doing? Or are we representing these more um, kind of intrinsic responses? And as you see, we ended up with a bit of a halfway. So we have here the intrinsic um, responses, the ones that are more automatic. And yet if you click here, you get to see um, a whole list of reparative responses as well. Um, so that, that is all, that's a nice way we go back. Um, now I got us back into the atlas. So from actions here, we will go into triggers. So this is such an incredibly as important aspect of emotion, and all of you who've done clinical work in the room know that identifying, working with, and even having the capacity to recognize triggers for any of your patients, let alone for ourselves in our daily life, is, is so important. It is absolutely the most kind of complex aspect of what we have in the Atlas, and one we struggled with a great deal and how to represent well. What we wanted people to understand is, though emotions can arise and actually also disappear within such a rapid cycle, that there is a sequence that occurs with emotions, that we have triggers, that these triggers are, um, come under our appraisal, and that these then have their states and actions. So we didn't know how to do this in a meaningful timeline alongside the images you saw before. Now, before you go on, yeah. I just want to emphasize that the term appraisal doesn't mean you're thinking about it consciously. Mm. Okay? It means that some part of your mental apparatus is recognizing it and dealing with it, typically an emotion that all occurs outside of awareness. Awareness is not normally, in my view, a central part of emotional experience. We, all of you have had the experience of someone saying to you, what are you upset about? And that's the first time you realize that you are upset and that you're acting in a way that shows that your emotions have been aroused. That's rarely at the beginning. It takes a lot of skill development if you want to introduce awareness into emotion. And only if you do will you have choice about what you feel and when you feel it and how you act when you have those feelings. Everybody wants those choices. Almost, it's not given to us by nature. That's a skill that you have to learn. Where you learn it, a school for emotion skills doesn't exist. It's not a central part of, the last time I looked, what most psychotherapies emphasize, which are much more cognitively oriented than emotionally oriented. And yet, a lot of people are looking for that kind of help to develop those kinds of skills. So with triggers here, um, what we wanted people to understand is that some of these triggers are universal and some of these triggers are learned. If people just had that bit of knowledge, we would be so enthusiastic. Um, where, where we have these difficulties often is when we're comparing ourselves to others or feel overwhelmed by our experience. Why did that upset me so much but didn't upset my friend? I, I don't get it. Why am I different? Or why is it that this same kind of pattern seems to arise whenever I have to deal with an authority figure? And so for us to have the tools to investigate what might be beneath our triggers. So we have these universal triggers like snake-like shapes. People probably know the research of we can show these shapes uh, very early in life and elicit a meaningful fear response. You can have um, things such as fear of losing a job. It might be coming from an earlier experience in life where there was a lot of instability financially or otherwise. And that uh, end of the day comment by your boss saying, we need to talk tomorrow morning. That could be for someone who feels, has this kind of database of perception, much bigger deal than someone who's had a lot of stability, feels they have a lot of options, and okay, talk tomorrow, great. 
No problem. So these different, these same. Um, it's called tenure. <laughs> <laughs> these, same, uh, these same events with what happens is something different in our perception. Now this, again, won't belabor this, but using this word perception, appraisal is just, it means everything to everybody and nothing to a lot of people. Uh, we couldn't really put that in as an aspect of what was important in this process of emotion. And we really ended up liking perception. Uh, there's actually meaningful overlap with the Buddhist, psycholo Buddhist psychological approach to the world, to emotion, um, and perception does help us and we thought give a good feeling of, oh right, that's something individual. Perception is mine. Um, and then what you see below here in your responses reminds you of what you just went through, these different actions, these different states. And with this timeline or triggers timeline of emotion, again, um, there's more information in the annex. So we have a, a bit of a more uh, full teaching tool. And I, anyone who's taken a course with me has, has seen this many times. It's one of my favorite teaching tools to help people walk through their experience of emotion from their trigger into their response. So I think what we'd like to do is just show you a couple more and then come together for our ideas of where we hope to see this atlas go and open up for uh, your questions and comments. So if we just, just to give you a bit more of a sense of some of the differences stylistically that we had with these emotions. So a very different look than we had, for instance, with fear, difference for sadness. I noticed that we're using not only color but shape to try to represent things. Fuzzier. Yeah. Yeah. What shape does that look like? Mm -hmm. For disgust we got not a little appealing, we got a little immature. Um, <laughs> And again, with each of these, also their same actions, triggers. And the place we didn't show you yet is we wanted to represent what we know very little about, <laughs> which is moods. And that with emotions, there are these, we just chose a representative mood that can occur with an emotion. And uh, though I think there's growing interest in moods, as evidenced by a recent call by Apple for us to learn how to track our moods on our cell phones. Um, hold, hold on, hold, keep, hold your breath and we'll see if that, if that happens. And moods are quite different from emotion. Oh, she's looking at me, so I should say a word or two about that difference. One is that we almost always know, at least afterwards, what provoked an emotion. What was the trigger? We don't all know what is the trigger for mood. Sometimes we wake up in a particular mood. So there's, a, I think, a much stronger set of biological determinants of moods uh, that we're usually totally unaware of. And moods take us over. They make the emotion that we feel when we're in the mood, if I'm in a sad mood, it's a lot easier to get me to cry than if I'm in an angry mood. Uh, so they facilitate the experience of an emotion that they're based on. At one point, I talked about moods being flooded emotions, flooded in the sense that they occur with a lot of things they ordinarily wouldn't occur to because you're in the mood that facilitates the experience of that emotion. Harder to manage as well when you're in that mood. If you're in an irritable mood, at one point I was going to sell buttons. One of them was going to be red and large, and it said, I'm in an irritable mood. Stay away. <laughs> if you're in an irritable mood, you're not fit for the company of other people. Uh, when you're in a sad mood, the button would say, I'm in a sad mood. Comfort me. I need comfort. Okay. Fear mood, I need reassurance. So each of these moods, in a sense, is making a request of another person. Uh, that you're dealing with. Different requests for different moods. But they endure over time, and often we don't know where they came from. We didn't choose them, and we can't point always to the stimulus 
that brought them forth. So our last visual here, just give you a moment. Once again, many attempts to figure out how to represent calm. Is it the absence of emotion? Is it what happens in between emotions? And we, we settled on enjoying this visualization, though there's a, lot, there's a lot of ways that we can understand how calmness is achieved. And there's um, books written on it, though I was surprised to find out not as much literature from psychology on states of calm. Um, and it's a place in which, as the Dalai Lama suggested in the video, where we have access to more choice, where we can at will then call upon compassion or call upon constructive anger. Um, Calmness, <coughs> although we all would like to feel calm, it's not what people come to us to pay us money to help them with. It's for the other emotions, not calmness. Mm -hmm. Now, if you open, it would really be interesting to see whether or not if you open a training program, or even you know, f four sessions to become an expert in experiencing calmness, would you get a lot of people coming to you? I think you would. Mm -hmm. It's a, an emotion. And of course, a lot of what we're bombarded with from, the, from advertisements to the internet, which isn't free of advertisements either, uh, is to achieve just the opposite of calmness. When you're in a calm state of mind, you're not going out and buying things. As that most famous scholar of American uh, activity said, the business of America is business. That was a former president who said that. I'm trying to remember. It wasn't Harding. I can't remember which one. Who? Herbert Hoover, yes. So, and you see where he got us. Huh? So, uh, there's more to, but to get to a calm state of mind, it's only in a calm state of mind that you can fully use your intelligence and fully use the fact that what words provide us, that as best we know, we're the only animal who has words, is the ability to represent and consider experiences we're not having. How I felt this morning. I can use words to retrieve and consider, and I can plan, and I can rehearse. I'm a great believer in rehearsing difficult interactions that you anticipate having. Uh, they, they allow for much more skillful behavior. <laughs> so this is this is where we would like to um, kind of come together with you with you all. There's again so much more we would have liked to include, so many more directions in this atlas, and we have great hopes that people will be able to use this for research, trainings, clinical work. Um, we think that this could be adapted meaningfully for work with children, people with emotional disturbances families, couples, and yet um, I think we're both in a, in a happy to be in a more resting period post working on the Atlas. It was um, a lot of work for a couple of years. And I, um, as my dad was saying, I've, had, I've been in touch with about a dozen teachers of cultivating emotional balance who are translating and figuring out ways to use it in Spanish and Portuguese and German um, and even the English language version being used in India and other places around the world. It's such a beautiful thing that we have this universal language. Unfortunately, the words are in English, so we do hope we'll be able to find the funds and support to make this atlas possible in other languages. We hope we find the support and expertise of people working with children who would like to create this for them. Um, and we're excited to hear how all of you here in this room and online might find ways to use it as well. Um, I think people are most surprised that we don't give them steps of how to reach calm. But the, rea the the simplicity of what we think this atlas can achieve is by becoming aware of and being able to identify your experiences of emotion, there's some opportunity for calm. We're never going to live free of emotion, nor would we want to. 
but to have that ability, that vocabulary to understand and examine and potentially do some work beforehand. What are my triggers? Or do some work after. What are the responses I'd like to change? That's where we have our ability for choice and awareness. That's one of the things I recommended to people in the days when I used to teach this stuff, is keep a diary of regrettable emotional episodes. You go over that diary after a few weeks or a month and see where are the commonalities that have led you into acting emotionally in a way that you regret afterwards. And if that doesn't do it, then go over that with a third person, someone who might help you figure out what it is you're missing so you'll have less regrettable emotional episodes. None of us want to live our life regretting how we've acted, and yet all of us do have that experience, and it often much more about emotion than anything else that we experience regret. So it's not that I regret the ideas, the mistaken ideas I had. Well, what harm do they do except for the poor graduate students who have to learn them and now unlearn them? The, uh, but it is the emotions to, that can lead us to act in ways that we think afterwards, wish I hadn't said that, wish I hadn't done that. So try to translate. We hope the Atlas will help people translate their wishes into actions. Uh, and uh, I once asked about it. What do I do if I know I'm about to have to deal with an extremely difficult person? But in the past, every time I've dealt with them, I've really gotten upset. And I've really said things that I wish I hadn't said. But that person's so difficult. And his advice was to rehearse. It's amazing. Rehearsals do help work. And if it doesn't, then, of course, seek third-party help. And I, I'll put one plug for the work I'm doing at UCSF. I've created a uh, daily emotion tracking app. And this will be used with residents who are interested and still seeking other departments who would like to join in on this pilot. And essentially doing this everyday tracking of your emotion for 10 days. My hope is that that will help people reduce stress and have some greater awareness. And working on the Atlas and being here at UCSF with the Osher Center has for me, just been such a treat. So I want to just say thank you to the OSHA Center and all the faculty who've supported me being able to donate my time to work that is not necessarily research and doesn't translate to that many published papers, but has been just incredibly meaningful. And we have a, a final slide for your of thanks. And <laughs> <laughs> now I want you to know that it was the Dalai Lama who insisted that we wear these Mickey Mouse hats. <laughs> I was afraid of the potential for ridicule. <laughs> he is not afraid of ridicule yeah. at all. And this was uh, his 80th birthday in Anaheim, which was one of the times we met to talk about the last oh, summer. Yeah, last summer. So, thank you all very much. Thanks for that question. Uh, surprise is one of the seven emotions that I've written the most about. Uh, I've featured in every book I've written about emotion and where I found evidence for universality in the expression. Uh, and yet, some theorists regard it as not an emotion because surprise is hedonically neutral. You can feel, when you're surprised, do you feel enjoyment? Do you feel disdain or sadness? Uh, it's really quite uncertain. And the, it is hedonically. But that arises from the idea that all the emotions must have evolved at the same point in human time or in animal time. Uh, we can incidentally observe surprise in uh, some other primates. Uh, the 
So I regard supplies as one of the, the only reason it's not represented in the atlas is because less than 70% of my fellow scientists think it has been firmly established. And we decided we would limit the atlas just to the ones that are firmly established. That's hopefully, I'm, many of the people in this room should have as a consequence of their work increasing the number of emotions that get represented in the next version of the atlas five or 10 years from now as more knowledge is acquired. And certainly I would hope surprise will be there. Do you remember what percentage you got? I think it was under 40 was the cutoff. But yeah, yes. I'd have to look it up in the article. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, there are, there are so many social emotional learning programs out there, and I know um, that a lot of work that was done with you and at PAU, and there's a lot of training programs on um, helping people identify their experience of emotion, work towards relaxation. But I think what, what he's talking about, there's an idea that he had with Mathieu Ricard and Richie Davidson, the gymnasium of compassion. Maybe it's a side school or a, you know, so some part of the main school building. The reason we thought of it as a gymnasium is because when you go to exercise physically, you go to a gym and there are a lot of different things you can use. And you don't use all of them. You find out which ones work the best for you. That might be the same for emotional skills. There might be a number of different things that we could have in this emotion gymnasium. And you can find out which one works the best for you and then use that or that subset of skills to develop more awareness and more choice about your own emotions. I actually think it should be integrated into everyday life. I mean, what better gymnasium for emotion skills than working in the ER at SF General? Or much of our clinical work, there's just, we just don't necessarily have the time to process, to reflect, and meaningfully make change or look ahead. But I, I really believe in actually mobile-based apps um, that I know you're a fan of as well. And having people give that in the moment opportunity to reflect. Once you have a vocabulary, like you can learn from the Atlas, then there's so many ways to kind of capitalize on that, sharing it with others or reflecting yourself. But I'd be curious your thoughts as well. <laughs> yes, sir. That's a very good suggestion, and it's one that I think we could uh, act on, uh, given the time, because uh, we have a very good catalog of different expressions. Uh, I was worried that people would get focused on the face once again and not deal with the information that's in the atlas. That was the only reason we didn't put it in. But there should be a link where you could click to see what these things look like. And I think that would be easy to do and make it more useful to people. sometimes works in the short term. Um, and when we think about calmness, and definitely um, I do think there's meaningful overlap here between the um, Buddhist psychology and Western um, psychological approach. And 
We got into a lot of semantic issues with this atlas. Calm is another semantic issue. It means different things to different people. At one point we thought, should we put content? But that has more of an enjoyable experience with it. And indeed, calmness isn't just a, uh, a lack of emotion. And so that's why we had the kind of emotions coming and going in our visualization. The idea being calm is a state in which emotions arise and fall, but maybe in which we don't hold on. Right? So a lot of the difficulty we get in emotions is not just that we experience them, but then we get in that regret spiral of, oh, God, why did I do that? Or if we're angry, why did they do that? And then we continue to blame and blame. So calmness, we would hope, gives us the spaciousness for emotions to arise and fall. Now, how do you put that in, like, three words on the atlas? I don't know, but I, I appreciate the clarification. Is that helpful? Great. Yes. This is a psychiatry department. The history of psychiatry <laughs> is people with problems. The people who are doing great don't come to see psychiatry. Okay? Psychiatry has been focused, as the whole medical profession is focused primarily, on illness, on trouble, on difficulty. Now, the idea of prevention, uh, Phil Lee, some of you may know that, namely was Chancellor here once. He was the man who gave me my faculty position in 1970 to head a school of prevention. He recognized that the biggest problem that health faces, obesity, uh, tobacco, and addiction, those are all preventable, and they are all due to psychological issues. It never came into existence. The School of Medicine didn't want a, a so-called fit school on the campus competing for funds, so it was stopped uh, in its tracks. But prevention still is the issue. Uh, in my mind, and most of these things are preventable. And we already, we don't need a crash program of research. We know how to prevent most of these things. We just don't teach that. And uh, now, Eve referred to this large literature on emotional learning, emotional skills learning. And that's where it gets taught. And surely the primary target should be the five to nine-year-olds. Uh, that's where you can really start having an impact that will last a long time. And that's incidentally what the Dalai Lama was asking, focus on the five-year-olds. I think adults need it too, but with the, just a brief answer, and, and this is actually a fact you on our site, because people ask that question a lot, and um, just because there are more representations of different families of emotions that are so-called negative, we really try to not emphasize this negative idea Again, this constructive emotion. Anger can be very constructive if it helps us push through uh, injustice or an even small injustices on a daily basis. Enjoyable emotion, though it is only kind of a one um, cluster, has a lot of states with a lot of different valence, a lot of different difference between pride and just kind of listening to music, so sensory pleasure, very different. Yeah, I in my book, Emotions Reveal, they distinguish 16 different types of enjoyment, raising the question to the reader, which ones do you specialize in? Which ones are you missing in your life and might like to have? Most of us don't experience all the enjoyable emotions that we're capable of. Nice thing to add. It's not there now. Uh, if somebody in this audience wants to volunteer to work with us to add it, we'll welcome it. Yeah. It's outside of our area yeah. of expertise, but there's every reason that for people who want to know that when they go to the Atlas, they should yeah. be able to find it. And why do you think people might want it? I'm just curious. Right. Right. Do you think, because I'm asking, because what I really would have liked to include but it was difficult was what do we experience on a physical level with our emotions? 
which is a whole other atlas of our embodied emotional experience. So I, I didn't know if that was also a way that people might connect to their emotions. I was an advisor to that program, and uh, Porter I like a lot. Uh, the whole part of memory uh, is nonsense. It doesn't fit what we know about memory. And uh, so I, you know, I wish they had told me they were going down that track. They didn't. They only asked me about the emotion side, not the memory side. I mean, we, we don't really choose. What a different life it would be if I could choose what it is I'm going to remember and what it is I'm going to forget and never remember at all. But that's not how humans are constructed. We don't have a choice about what we remember. We have a choice about how we deal with our emotional memories, but not whether we're going to remember or not. That was, is built into us. And you would get a false impression from inside out about that. But kids but, love it, but, and they care about their emotions, and that's awesome. They like the emotion part of it. Yeah. yeah, not the memory. Well, the memory part there's, there's is a, misleading. There's a parent's guide that my dad wrote yeah. to Inside Out that's also on his website for free. Yeah. So anyway. What, what parents can use to talk to their kids about Inside Out? our goal was really to be available and kind of complementary to the many therapies like DBT out there. And I mean, there's so many compassion-based therapies that are awesome, emotion-based therapies, and really how they can use the Atlas is we're excited, but I don't think we're going to try to create a training program or um, kind of say this is how it should be used. We're excited to hear from you, like, how's it go with your patients who, you know, do have these kinds of struggles? Does an awareness of emotion help them or not? Um, my, my hunch is that by becoming more aware of your emotions, you realize you're actually doing better than you think you are. Uh, there's some research evidence to support that. I presented in uh, Wendy Bray Mendez's lab just last week on just some of my emotion tracking data that even residents whose burnout levels are not surprisingly very high experience half of their emotions are enjoyable on a daily basis. What does that, what's that mean? Or what's that show? And that's exciting. Yes, each of the emotions has both a sound as well as a facial expression. Uh, one of the theorists uh, who I who influenced me, Sylvan Thompson, said if you don't hear it, then it's partially backed up. And uh, in the infant, you see and hear. Okay? It is, but we usually emphasize hearing it is really obnoxious. I mean, I cannot look if I don't want to, but I can't turn off my ears. So the thing we emphasize in training others as parents is to stop making those sounds. And so there's a lot of backing up of the sound of an emotion. And uh, uh, the we could ask Decker if he's interested. He has that library of vocal tones associated mm -hmm. with emotion. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's been done, which is great. So we wouldn't need to do it. Dr. Keltner at Berkeley worked with Dan Cadero, and he did these kind of universals. Yeah, I class here before. I mean, it's all work. Yeah. The fundamental work was all classes, uh, and it's all available. It just hasn't been added into the kind of tool we've developed. But we haven't added in the faces yet, either. Yeah. Are you about to ask a question, Marty, or am I just anticipating? <laughs> You can do both. In your experiences, uh, I think what you talked about initially and what some of the questions have been about, suppose there's a landlord who's experiencing burnout. And um, uh, you're using the tool in the way, but a lot of what you're saying. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, one that it's funny. I was just asked this yesterday. Well, what is you know what what on earth could this do? Both actually, the question was, what could this do when someone is experiencing burnout, and what could it do when they're experiencing satisfaction? So I, I'll answer both. And with burnout, you know, let, you know they get this reminder. Um, let's say that uh, it's time to track your emotion. And with fear that you're describing, maybe anxiety over uh, the rotation that they're on. I hear this a lot in the groups that I lead. I'm going to be in this, this setting where I'm, I have no expertise. I'm at a level of training where it matters to me that I do well, but I don't think I can do it well. But that's a lot of uh, fear. There might be an acute version of that fear in the moment that's useful. Like, oh God, I don't know what to do. This is terrible. I really need to find someone, even though it's going to feel, you know, a little, uh, feel insecure about having to ask for help. I'm going to. That is a great fear experience, um, and it's constructively enacted. However, the fear and rumination and worry and anxiety that either precedes or follows that, that's where the, I would think, kind of checking in on your experience could be helpful. So again, it's not to prevent or create a numbness around emotion, but to really recognize, well, what was the trigger to that? And is this continued potential rumination worthwhile? Or, and it's interesting because even through the process of tracking your emotion, it becomes a difficult research tool because you're helping people, right? Accidentally, just by asking people to reflect, they end up reappraising and, and improving their situation. On the satisfaction side, let's say they had a great encounter with a patient who was doing poorly and was now feeling better. They're asked about that, and they get another opportunity to savor and enjoy. This is what's happening. The idea would be for people to just do this for 10 days, maybe twice a year. And I'm interested in real longitudinal research. What does this look like over five or 10 years? Uh, not fundable, <laughs> not, not totally fundable, and not all the other supported, but I really think that's the way to help people. Give them those uh, opportunities for self-reflection and looking at their trends over time. And then your comment, you had a question and a comment. Good metaphor. Doors is a good metaphor. Everybody knows what they are, at least in literate cultures. In non-literate cultures, I found there were no doors. People lived in little houses that had no doors at all. So you had to go off into the bush to get privacy, literally. No, it's a, yeah, that, that'll, that's probably about a year out till it's on the App Store, um, but yeah, and there's a, you can sign up actually through the Atlas for updates when that happens, but just the research 
component will be going for the next year. Yeah. Yes. You know, I don't think we've really dealt with that within the boundaries of the atlas itself. Uh, I mean, it is a fundamental fact about that. that you don't usually experience emotion by sitting down and thinking, you know, I'd like to feel a little afraid today. Can I feel afraid? Uh, let's try some anger. See how that works uh, for me. Yeah, it happens to us, and the very word itself uh, expresses that fact that emotions are things that take us over, we don't choose which emotions. We'd like to choose which emotions we're going to experience, but we typically don't. Now, that all gets broken by the entertainment system, which now means that everybody can have in their pocket is, I have a cell phone, and I can choose my entertainment. By choosing my entertainment, I can choose what emotions I'm going to feel. Am I going to watch something that scares me, that gets me angry? Well, I can think of who I could watch that would get me angry. Uh, the, uh, or disgusted, you know. Uh, I used to find that when I, in the old days, when I would give a, a talk to medical students, that I, one of the things I would say to them is, don't think of disgust as a totally unenjoyable emotion. Some people really can enjoy feeling disgusted even by their own body products, and the laughter that would occur, the embarrassed laughter that would occur, because everyone has had that experience, that disgust is not only a negative emotion. It can be quite enjoyable, even if it's self-disgust, let alone feeling disgusted by others. My gosh, I think that's going to play an important role in the next election, is disgust. <laughs> Go ahead. It was certainly one of the ones we asked him about, but he got only a 40% endorsement. Those were the demographics that you were responding to. They were, uh, they had a lot of uh, non-Western. Uh, there's a lot of emotion research in Japan and in China, both. Uh, so uh, I don't think it was biased in that sense. It's just that there's less work. Remember, we were asking how much is there a research that irrefutably establishes this emotion? Well, that reflects the people who've done the research. Uh, and, you know, 90% of the research, in fact, every Japanese scholar I know publishes in English. English is the lingua franca for science. Uh, that's probably because we won the war. But for whatever reason, everything gets published in English in, in, or a translation into English. Uh, and that's where the advances occur. So there are emotions that could be considered unique to a particular culture. Uh, but again, we have chosen to focus on those that are pan-cultural. And uh, there are plenty of those. And I think the five that we've chosen will be likely to be eight or nine within another five to seven years of research. So it's not going to stay at five. There'll be more research.
very interesting points. I, I, I struggle with understanding how they could be beneficial in terms of representation in the atlas. And let me just finish here because what you're describing is, um, I, I would say, compelling. I, I, your, your view of what calm is, is, is yours and unique too. Um, and I think that it, it doesn't mean that we're apart or sitting on a cushion. Right? And I, I think the idea of calm is that we aren't in a state of action and reaction, action and reaction, action and reaction. And that, I, I hope, would make sense to you. And you don't have to be in a spa to do that. Um, and I, I do think that having an ideal or a goal that isn't happy was the main objective for us. We don't want people to think that that's the, that's the ideal. I think that can be a lot of detriment and make people feel worse about their difficult or disturbing emotional experiences that are necessary and part of life. So I think that was our goal with Calm. So it wasn't to suggest that we all need to isolate ourselves or be in some sort of, um, you know, state of samadhi at all times. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess with the cultural issues, I mean, the whole idea with being able to establish this on scientific evidence is um, the objective is that these scientists are looking at emotion irrespective of cultural factors. There's a whole enormous school of uh, emotion researchers who look at cultural factors. But we didn't include that in this because it's more, it creates more differences than similarities. Thank you.